right. Good morning, everyone. That was pretty good, good stuff, huh? Boy, you ever hear that group, the Petersons, before? I, I never have. I found them. They're, they, they are sweet. They are good. They are good. Hey, I'll be in um, 2 Peter 1. As I said, we're speaking a message this morning called, In This Moment. In This Moment. Um, Marvin Linsky, who is an old, uh, I think a Lutheran, right? An old Lutheran scholar. He said, the sweetest word in the entire scripture to the sinner is the word grace. Um, a couple words in there. Sinner and grace. Sinner would include all of you. <laughs> but grace includes all of you too. So that's good. That's good news. That's why it's a sweet word to us. We'll talk about sinners later because I have a bunch of personal sins that some of you have been committing I'm going to talk about um, here. No, I'm, only, I'm only messing with you. Spurgeon said you cannot separate God's grace from God's glory. I've always remembered that. I read that many, many decades ago, and I'll never forget that one statement. I forget where he said it. But grace is a one-sided word. God gives it. That's it. It's, it's all him. We have not earned it. We do not pay it back. It's not a loan. Um, there's no bill in the mail, as we like to say. Grace does not oblige us to anything, does not oblige us to obedience, it does not oblige us to service, it does not oblige us to anything that we ought to be doing. It's simply given, unmerited, and that's such a huge word, unmerited to those who receive it. And that's why God's grace, like Spurgeon said, um, brings him glory. That's why in Ephesians 2, 7, in the ages to come, that he sh may show the exceeding riches of his grace. That particular verse talking about you and I being in the eternal state. Um, when the angels are looking at us being there and thinking, how, you know, and, and God just worship. God worships them. I mean, I'm sorry, the angels worship God because he sees us. And they know who we are, clay feet. They, and, but they worship God because of his mercy and his grace. Um, it can never be withdrawn. It's not a payment or reward for our good um, behavior or increased level of commitment. It is a holy, unmerited gift from the God of all grace, 1 Peter 5.10. These are great thoughts. We could just stop there and just meditate on them and think about those things and marinate them in your brain and it, it changes you, starts changing you from the inside out. William Newell wrote wonderful commentaries. He was one of the best teachers and commentators on grace from his era. Grace is neither treating a person as he deserves, not a person better than he deserves. It is treating him graciously without the slightest, slightest reference to what he deserves. <laughs> Isn't that good? I don't, you know, I mean, it, Take, bring that into the marriage. <laughs> no, it doesn't apply to marriage. No, no. no it's, it's treating them graciously without the slightest reference to what he deserves. Now, we spend much time, I'm going to spend a little time this morning, talking about what I'm going to call the past gospel. It's not bad. It's, it's actually amazing. There's nothing wrong with it. What the gospel accomplished for us past needs to be our consistent and constant meditation if we're going to really experience spiritual transformation. In other words, the gospel brought forgiveness to our lives. When I said yes to Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit came into me, um, he pronounced me forgiven. He took all my sins on him, paid for all my sins, and he pronounced me for forgiven for all eternity. Does it mean I still ask for forgiveness when I screw up in time? Absolutely. But that's a question of fellowship with God, as we'll see, not a question of my standing with God. Um, some of us don't get really moved by that thought that the gospel brought forgiveness to us because somehow in our brains, we think there is, there is at least a little good in us. <laughs> or at least I can look at somebody else I know that's a little bit better than me and think, um, and think well, at least I'm not like that person. Or I watch people on the news, at least I've never done anything like that. When grace really doesn't give you that luxury. So when we talk about forgiveness, and, and here I have been walking with God just about 40 years now, and, it's, um, and I can tell you, when I 
um, the more I understand my need, the greater the word forgiveness means. The more I understand sin, the larger forgiveness becomes. And how subtle sin is and how customized sin is for all of us. We think we have a little good. We don't really grasp the purity and the holiness of God. If we could, um, it would be life-altering and life-changing. We don't really grasp the darkness of all sin and the presence of God's holiness. I, I often said that when I believe when I die, or the rapture of the church comes right before the tribulation period, <laughs> when I die, um, the first thing I'm going to um, experience and understand is the darkness of sin and the glory of grace. Because right now it's, it's muted through my human understanding and my human um, frailties that I have. But that moment, I'm going to see what heaven is. I'm going to see what hell is. I'm going to see the, the, the torment of hell and why it was created to punish sin. And then I think we're going to forget all about our stuff. Because we're going to be so wrapped up in what Jesus Christ did to us. Grace introduces us into the family of God. This is, I'm just talking about the past gospel here. I'm, I'm an adopted son of God. He, when I said yes to Christ, he brought me into his family. That points to this tremendous in, intimacy. It wasn't just um, static. It wasn't just clinical. It wasn't professional. It was intimate. It was family. He brought us into his family. We stand through our, our life as a believer as being in Christ. And nothing can ever pluck me out of being in Christ. Those two words are amongst the most powerful two words in the entire Bible. In Christ. I means God, Tim took, um, Jesus took Tim Kelly, placed him out of the world, and placed him in his son, Jesus Christ. And that's my new identity. And that's how he sees me, as being in his son, Jesus Christ. It has to be that way. If it was any other way, I'd be toast. But so he sees me as being in Christ. And we see those words, I think it's 83 times in the book of Ephesians alone. In Christ. We read it in our English Bible it's so cavalierly, but in the original language, it explodes. We've been placed in Christ. We've done many messages of that through the years. He's inhabited us with his own life, and the salvation of man is a, a finished work. The cross stands in history as the moment when the sin issue that separated God and his creation was finally resolved. And love could be destroyed again, unhindered. Now, I also believe, and we also believe, John 3, 16, that God, for so God so loved the world that whosoever believes on him, we believe this salvation is eternally secure in the moment we're sealed with the Spirit unto the day of redemption. Um, in Ephesians 4.30, is unto the day of redemption. In other words, I have a salvation God gives me. We do not believe we can lose it. Some are going to disagree with that, but that's have to go to another church for that one. <laughs> because we, we, we believe wholeheartedly. You know why? Because salvation has nothing to do with us. We just say yes to it. I don't have to maintenance it. I don't have to get under the hood and tweak it. I don't have to do any of that thing. I just, I just stand in it. Well, Pastor, that's unfair. It is. I get it. There's nothing fair about the grace of God. It's, it's the just for the unjust, dying for the unjust. Nothing fair about God's grace. It's totally twisted. <laughs> I would never give grace. God does. I would have a human way of dealing with things. I'd, say, I'd be a Ronald Reagan, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, buddy. <laughs> and God says, I'll pick you up. And I'll place you in my son. And I'll do all the work. So that's the past gospel. But then we have the, the future gospel. I love this. this I spend a lot of time reflecting on the future gospel because it helps me in time and space. Romans 8.30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate. This is a really powerful verse, by the way. He also called, in whom he called those who he justified. That's salvation. In whom he justified, he glorified. In other words, he said, and this is in a tense in the Greek where it says, if you are predestined, if you are called, and you are, if you are justified, and you are, uh, and then you are glorified, and you are, even though you're not there yet. 
But your glorification of Christ in heaven is secure. So our standing in grace will become our eternal status the moment we pass from this realm to our future home, our permanent home, heaven, through death or the pre-tribulational rapture. <laughs> I'm just having fun with that. Now, um, Galinsky went on and said this, the quality of, of grace will be displayed upon us in the world to come. And we talked about Ephesians 2, 7 already. So when I die, I'll be, I'll be presented faultless before the Father. Future gospel, Jude 24. He presents me faultless. Without any moral spots, Ephesians 5, 27. It's future. I mean, when I get presented to the Father, He's going to present me holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. All incredible words in Colossians 1.22. Future gospel. Death has lost all of its sting. I don't know when we're going to die, but death has lost all of its sting. I love this. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, a couple of my favorite verses in the scriptures. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, and that the, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as the Father, um, only as a, I'm sorry, for only as a human being could, be, could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who has the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Isn't that amazing? Because I, I know I can stand here before you as I have no fear of dying. And I know many of you have the same testimony. Some people thinking, yeah, bring it on. Now, I want to know how I'm going to die. If I can change that, write that script, I would do that. I, I don't want to get sick. I don't want to get in a car wreck. I don't want to be lying in a hospital bed. I'm just giving God all my, my wishes here. When I, when, I, when I die, I just want to be um, walking in the park or at a baseball game, and a piece of space junk hit me in the back of the head, and I'm gone, just like that. Meteorite. I'm, I'm good with whatever it is, but, it's, um, but I'm just gone. It happens that quick. And um, right after I win the lottery, so it's um, so I can I can make sure my 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 family can you know, do well when I'm gone. My wife's like, you shut up right now. You're not down going anywhere. <laughs> the tragedy. This is a tragedy, and this is where I really want to focus on. Now, if you Christians, as you see or embrace their faith in this moment, and I'm talking to myself as much as I'm, I'm always talking to myself. I look at my past gospel, I reflect on the future gospel, but there's also a now gospel. A gospel for the now. Um, I think it was um, Paul Tripp called them gospel amnesiacs. <laughs> we forgot. Um, we forget that the gospel is present now. Yes, it's past. It did all these things for us in the past. And yes, it's future, but it's not inactive in between. In this little stint called life. It just didn't kick in when we got saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit and then kicks in again when we die. It's kicked in. <laughs> and it's been kicked in. This gospel is meant to be an active force in the present as much as it was to be an active force in the past and the future. I was reading this verse yesterday in my Bible reading. I put it in my notes. Hebrews 10, 14. And by one offering, he... he he, for one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. So for one offering past, he forever, um, um, future, made perfect those who are being made current, holy. We're in the process of being made holy. Now when does that stop, Philippians 1.6? When I die or in the pre-tribulational rapture. <laughs> one of those things. That's when, that's when it stops. Now I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you a quote by Paul Tripp again. This was this morning's devotional, so I couldn't get it into my actual message notes. But I was reading it this morning, and it's like, wow! I should just read this and close. He says, "This is um, the, um today's the fourth. Perhaps all good theology. This is Paul Tripp. Is meant to be both humbling and comforting at the same time." Why is this? God did not intend the theology of the Bible to be an end in itself, as if theological knowledge were the goal of God's grace. No, every part of the Bible's teaching is designed to be a means to an end, and the end is a radically transformed life. 
Why doesn't God just save me from the beginning and welcome me into his presence in the end and leave me to myself in between? <laughs> Why is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit presented as an absolute gift of necessity for every believer? The answer is because of the utter gravity of my condition as a sinner. You see, justification deals with the guilt of sin and final glorification with the ultimate defeat of sin, but the presence and power of sin that remains in between life must be addressed or the work of grace will not be complete. Sin does not leave me merely guilty. It renders us unable. It robs us from the ability to live in a way that can please God. <laughs> Great quote. So he's talking about the in-between of grace. When we're in the middle of the in-between, not only does it secure us, it's all impacting our present real-time life as a current active ministry in me today, October 4th, 2020, and we'll have tomorrow too, helping me to live a godly life, whether that's through conviction, through inspiration, through um, the power of the Holy Spirit to turn my back on things, to change the way I think, to change my, 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 um, my, my values, my priorities. It conforms me into the image of Christ. And this goes on our entire life. Let me read you these passages. I've read a little large, but first, second Peter chapter one. And I believe it talks about um, the, the, the current work of the Spirit in us right now. May, in verse 2, may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge. Now, the word knowledge there is important because there's different words in the Greek New Testament for knowledge. This particular one is epinosis, and that's the strongest word you can have. But it, it's, a, it's experiential knowledge. It's knowledge that you put into practice. It's knowledge that impacts your life on a regular basis. It's not just head knowledge. That'd be a different word altogether. This word means, no, this is knowledge that, that impacts me and has influence on me and changes the way that I think. We said for years, I only really know anything that I can, I can put into practice. I can have a concept, but I don't really know it until it impacts my life in that type of way. By his divine power... Um, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We, are received, we have received all of this, this coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us a great and precious promises, the word of God. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. Now, we know we have his divine nature, but now these promises that we are real time, we share in these divine natures and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Now, in view of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness. He's talking about a transformed life here. And godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everybody. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the epinosis. But those who fall, fail to develop in this way are short-sighted, or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their own sins, old sins. Wow. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So it gives us an outline right there. We are partakers of his divine nature, partakers of his precious promises. And the more that we exercise these qualities, which are the qualities of the Holy Spirit, we, the more we, we, we become more like Christ. And that's, goal, that's Christ's goal for me. Because not only does he want to transform me into his image, he wants me to represent him into, the, into this world. And the more that I rep trans I'm transformed into his image, the greater witness I have to the world in which I live. So more people can come to know him. And more people can be transformed. So thus the gospel becomes my frame of reference in life, in real time. 
Past gospel, future gospel, present gospel, it's all, it all becomes my frame of reference, at least I want it to be, when I'm confronted with the devil's accusations, and he never shuts up, ever, accuses the, the brethren day and night, Revelation 12, 9 and 10, accuser of the brethren, his very name means slanderer. So he's slandering us day and night, 24 hours a day, but what's my answer for his accusations? Because one of the things the devil likes to do is use facts. <laughs> he, can, he has all sorts of facts on me <laughs> that he can, Tim, you're this because, and I, you know, you know, you're right. But there's a higher level of truth than my experience. The level of truth is the gospel. That the past gospel, the future gospel, and the present gospel. So this is my way to cast down accusations from the devil. It's my frame of reference when I'm faced with forgiving others. When, when my heart feels that it's too wounded to do that. It becomes my frame of reference. This gospel. They don't deserve to be forgiven. You're right. They don't. They should pay. Badly. <laughs> But, but, I hate grace. I want grace, I want grace to have a hammer. No, it, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just accepts and forgives. Now, will God exact um, um, judgment and judge people? Yeah, absolutely. Will the consequences? Yeah, absolutely. We, well, most of the stuff we go through in life, isn't it just a product of our own decisions? Most of the time. And, and I've watched people who live a life when they're slandering. And, 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 and Dr. Lewis, you have these stories too. And Pastor Go, where you watch people, they live a certain way. At some point, it's exposed. No one gets away with anything. God brings justice and judgment starts in the house of God. See, there's a throne of grace where we can run to where we're great when we have a great time of need. Hebrews 4.16. Um, 4, there's grace to meet me during life's greatest burden and trials right here, right now. Right here, right now. Glenn Evans said this, and I won't go much longer here. The gospel is simply a collection of words, terms and phrases, all of which are difficult to understand unless they are made clear by someone's life. Looking at us, the unsaved community should be able to immediately see a connection between what we are and what the gospel is declaring. And, and that's why we have a real-time, present gospel that's active in us. And that's why you're here this morning and, and live. And that's why you're listening online. And that's why you may be tuning in on YouTube later on in the week. Because you want to hear what God has to speak to you or wherever it is that you're getting fed, and whatever books that you're reading in the quiet hours, and your own spiritual disciplines in your life, you want Jesus Christ to transform your life. You want to be more like him. I do not want to be more like me. I'm not really happy with me. I want to be more like him. I want to reflect his character, his nature, his love, his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his compassion. I want to reflect it to the world. I want to be a witness that way. I don't want to be me to the world. I want to be Christ to the world. Now, Pastor, that's, that's so hard. It is. But this is what we do. We show up. We just show up. We show up for church. Well, that helps. But no, we just show up at the throne of God. Say, God, this is who I am. This is who I'm battling. This is what I'm battling with. This is my struggle. I know this is what you say. I talk about this all the time when we talk about people's forgiving other people. And that's, just, that's a big issue with many people. And it's been an issue I've had to overcome in my own life. And I would say, God, I forgive that person. But I knew I didn't. Because <laughs> my insides were still torn up by them. And so, God, I forgive that person. And then I say, God, you know I'm lying. <laughs> but I want to forgive them. I desire to forgive them. I don't want to have my heart, this resentment or this bitterness in my heart. God, you know that. I don't want it, but it's there. I've been so deeply wounded. I, it's there. So, but God, I forgive them by faith. <laughs> then I pray for them. That always helps, believe it or not. 
I pray for the person, and I don't pray they die. I pray that God would bless them and, and, and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, um, the, the Spirit of God starts changing the heart, changing the heart, and, 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 and all of a sudden, you're, and it doesn't mean this reconciliation is going to take place, because that might never happen, usually doesn't. But it means that person who has wronged you doesn't have control of your inner man anymore. You're free from them. It's good news. Have we stopped feeding on the spiritual food of God's grace even though um, the grace of God has not come anywhere near finishing the work in us yet? He's not done with me. I'll never forget Guy Duff's um, statement he said to me right I think right here in this room um, back back at that point he was probably in his mid 80s and he just said you know I retired he was 50 years on the mission field right and running a worldwide missions outfit and he just said I thought God when I retired God would let me re retire too but <laughs> God's still working on me God was still working on him and he did right until he went home to be with the Lord a few years back so I asked myself this question um, do I still hunger after the things I used to hunger for as I was a young believer? Do I still hunger to, to be more like Christ, to be spiritually transformed? I hope we do. Or are we simply satisfied with being maybe a little bit more religious or a little bit more spiritual in the sense like I can have spiritual disciplines in my life, but the character never gets transformed? See, when the Spirit can reign unhampered, and the Spirit uses the Word of God to do this, um, and it, starts it starts this transformation process in all of our lives. I'm not the same man I was 40 years ago. I'm not the same man I was 30 years ago, and 20 years ago, and 10 years ago. And I hope I'm a different man next year than I am today. It's a work in progress. My... Um, my um, my level of needing God has increased. It hasn't decreased. <laughs> you would think after a while I'd have a few things down. Well, I do. I know how to study the Bible. I know how to communicate the Bible. I know how to talk to people. And I have a lot of things down. I need God more than ever. <laughs> because the more that I get closer to Christ and the more the Holy Spirit has access in me, I see this stuff in my heart that just ain't right. That was a little slang there. <laughs> this ain't right. And um, when the Spirit reigns unhampered, transformation happens. And when that happens, my friends, marriages change. Or at least one person in the marriage changes. Finances change. Friendship changes. Parenting changes. My secret life changes. Our values change. Our pursuits change. Our, uh, my emotions change. My speech changes. My tongue and how I communicate changes. It all changes because there's a work of the Spirit in me conforming me into the image of Christ in the now gospel. In this moment, it happens. Well, Pastor, how do we speed it up? You can't. You can in a sense you can just show up. You show up at the throne of God. You show up where the Word of God is. You show up where God's people are. You show up, make sure your Bible gets opened up and you hide the Word in your, in your heart and you pray and you ask God, Christ, I want to be more like you. I want to be conformed into your image. And when you see something growing in your heart, some spiritual disease, then you take it to God and you deal with it as quickly as you can between you and God and transformation happens. You've watched people that have been walking with God for a long time. They're like a smooth stone that's been in a river. They just, they don't have a lot of rough edges anymore. They just sort of take things because they've just been walking with God. And they've been transformed into his image. F.B. Meyer said this, and we'll close. See, salvation is a great word. It includes the forgiveness that remembers our sin no more. Deliverance from the curse and the penalty of our evil ways. Emancipation from the thrall of evil habit. The growing conformity of the soul to the image of Christ. And the final resurrection of the body in spiritual beauty and energy. To be forever the companion and vehicle of the redeemed spirit. So we want to change the world. We can. Um, we have to change the world inside of us. 
Let the Spirit change me. Let the Spirit transform me. Let God has His way in me. And sometimes that may mean a, a um, priority change, priority shift, a values change, a value shift, but let Him change me. And then God will use me to change the world. Jesus, thank you for these words and the precious people here. Every head bowed, every eye closed as we do every service here at Grace Connection. We want to give people an opportunity to be saved. In a quiet place of your heart, between you and God. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Come into my life and save me. We understand there's a past gospel, a present gospel, and a, and a future gospel. Father, I'm starting right now on my road. I accept your sacrifice on the cross for my sin so I can live forever with you, future, and I can have you transform me in the present. Change me from the inside out. You said that prayer and you uh, meant it. Then let somebody know, let us know online um, if you said it you know, two years from now you're watching this message on YouTube just let us know that you accepted Christ we get messages like that from here time to time and it really really blesses us Father bless the offering we're about to share Father we give it in grace and um, bless this last song as we know it will be something that really moves people in Jesus name Amen